People power rocks the Arab world and beyond. How can, how should Europe adapt to the changing political landscape since the Arab Spring upheaval and support the shift toward democracy? Hello, I'm Chris Burns and welcome to People First, the EPP Group's monthly show on issues with impact on people like you. Also on the program, Syria, how can we Europeans help to stop the bloodshed from a continuing rebellion? And the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, could the next go to the Arab world? Uh, joining us on this program is Yanis Kasulidis, who's the EPP Group's Vice Chairman and Spokesman on Foreign Policy. Welcome to the show, Mr. Kasulidis. Let's go to our first report, which has to do with how Europe should be dealing with the rebellions that have succeeded. The toppling of autocratic regimes in North Africa has caused a rethink of the EU's European Neighbourhood Policy, or ENP. The ENP aims to encourage stability, prosperity and democratic development in the countries around the EU. But the EPP group wants it revised to be more people-oriented. What has to come extremely clear out of this new neighbourhood policy is that we are going to be much more open, we are going to contribute much more with the new democracies than with those that keep on different uh, systems of, uh, of governance. For the EPP group, the prospect of transformation in the southern dimension is an opportunity that's too good for the EU to miss. If they regain their dignity, if their standards of living improve, we have several advantages out of it. And now I'm being a bit selfish as an European. Look, I mean, we resolve lots of problems in the immigration issue. Even if we will, of course, continue to have uh, uh, immigration coming from, from our neighbors. Second, I mean, we have 100 million more of, 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 uh, of consumers next door. In particular, the EPP group has led efforts to build links with parliamentarians and civil society in the region. And now it will intensify efforts to support the reform process and build genuine democracy. Mr. Casolitas, here's a Vox Pop question on Arab Spring. Ce qu'ils devraient faire au niveau de l'Europe, c'est plus aider le peuple et pas de sous-entendu par rapport aux, uh, aux, aux élus de là-bas. Well, it seems she's talking about the past, don't you think? Things have changed, or haven't they? Well, I hope they have changed. At least the lesson learned. And it, I think we have took the necessary conclusions here in the Parliament is that uh, what our good relations have to be based on are with the peoples of our neighborhood, not necessarily with their governments. And what is your reaction to these latest sectarian killings in Egypt of Christians? Well, the European Parliament and particularly the EPP is extremely sensitive uh, to these developments and is particularly wary when we see a, a minority, whether it's Christian or not, that's a second issue, uh, that is uh, persecuted and discriminated upon. And I am afraid that the Coptic uh, community in Egypt has been discriminated upon by various regimes and it is extremely disappointed if after the Arab Spring it's still discriminated upon. Killing 24 people in a demonstration is totally unjustifiable. And so this is kind of a litmus test for that new government. Then. Absolutely. Let's focus on, on the Syrians now, the Syrian government. The struggle continues there, and what should Europe's role be in that conflict? As the death toll rises into the thousands, calls intensify for the international community to take tougher action against the government of Bashar al-Assad. Mr. Kasulides recently addressed the parliament on the issue. This is an intolerable situation. For how long will the international community continue to be a spectator to such bloodshed? Shame to the Security Council for not being able until now to agree on a resolution contenting themselves to a mere statement. One wonders how Russia and China can remain passive towards these cold-blooded massive assassinations. Words that carry even more weight after China and Russia vetoed a UN Security Council resolution calling for tougher sanctions against Syria. Mr. Kasulides says the EPP group strongly condemns what he calls an irresponsible action. Existing sanctions have begun to bite, affecting the Syrian economy, cutting the flow of cash into the country. But when they begin to affect the Assad government remains to be seen. 
Oh, Mr. Casalitas, uh, here's a Vox Pop question uh, on the Syrian government that, that seems to be pointed at you and the rest of the European Parliament. I will ask them for why they keep him in the power there, why they don't use everything, everything for take him out because they're killing people, they let people suffering there. Well, he's obviously suggesting the use of force, if I understand him correctly. Should force be considered? The use of force can only take place after the authorization by the Security Council. Here we have a difficulty in the Security Council to merely issue a condemnation resolution. You don't you go to force immediately. You have to follow a number of steps. And there is this wrong notion, particularly of permanent members like China and, uh, and in Russia of the non-interference in internal affairs. But there is also an international humanitarian law out there. And of course you interfere, as it was done in the past, when you feel that innocent civilians are in danger of massacres of this nature. But following up on that, even this initiative that failed in the Security Council is about sanctions. And a lot of people say, well, sanctions aren't going to work anyway. It really is the use of force that's needed. What do you think? Sanctions coming from the West only are not sufficient. So let's see, because it's a combination of things. The Arab League only now started condemning uh, the attitude of the Assad regime. Uh, so there is a combination of things that need to work first. The use of force is of last resort. Well, let's turn it down to the Sakharov Prize and the chance that one or more leaders uh, behind Arab Spring uh, could actually uh, become one of those winners. But first, let's take a look at the history of the prize itself. Andrei Sakharov was a scientific genius, one of the Soviet Union's top nuclear physicists. But Sakharov was also an inspiration to countless millions around the world for his brave and principled stance against the totalitarianism and political repression in the USSR. Sakharov refused to be intimidated, even when he was hounded out of his job and banished into internal exile. He died in 1989, so he never got to see the collapse of the system he fought so strongly. But his legacy lives on in the Sakharov Prize for the Freedom of Thought. This annual prize is awarded by the European Parliament to recognize those who have followed his example of defending human rights. Over the past two decades, individuals and organizations the world over have been honored for their courage and commitment to speaking out against injustice and tyranny. Among them, Cuban journalist and dissident Guillermo Farinas was awarded in absentia last year and Russia's human rights group Memorial the year before. Now, uh, Mr. Casulitas, you and other MEPs are proposing that five people from Arab Spring be nominated for this award. Why not just one? The Arab Spring has not fulfilled its destiny. That's only the beginning. And there is now a, the opportunity to work into establishing a, a true democracy in the countries that are struggling, some of them have got their freedom, Syria hasn't got it yet, and so forth. So we've chosen one or two from every of these countries, beginning from Bouazizi, the young man who self-immolated himself uh, and sparked the, the Arab uh, Spring, the Jasmine Revolution. Let's, let's take a look at a Vox Pop question on that. I would like to know why the... Europe have two positions in the human rights in uh, Arabic world. Uh, one side in Libya, Syria, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Europe have a clear position about the human rights, but in Palestine, Europe have not a really position about the conflict in Israel and Palestine. I suppose you might beg to differ. Yeah, I don't, I don't share the view of the, of the questionnaire. I think that uh, we have a consistent policy regarding the human rights of the Palestinian people and their right to their own state and their uh, right to live in dignity, which is the key word, I think, both for the Arab Spring and for the Palestinian question. But I think that uh, we have to be realistic and look how this can be achieved. Just with words, it will never be achieved. It will be achieved through talks on the ground 
between the two sides according to the uh, uh, to the timetable set and the call by the quartet. In, in any case, uh, difficult to find a more dramatic context for this uh, issue about the Sakharov Prize. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Casalidis, for joining us on the program. That's it for now on uh, People First. Uh, find out more about the EPP Group's activities on a broad range of issues by checking eppgroup.eu. That's it for now. Until next time, thanks for watching.